Okay, next up we have ah, Steve Heller. Um, this is another name where I don't know. I'm fine. It would be weird if you were in this auditorium right now or at SVA in general and didn't know who Steve Heller is. Obviously, a prolific author, um, an art director, and commentator on the design in our culture. So probably one of the best people to be speaking at today's conference. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Heller. Good morning. I'm male. Uh, the title of this talk was Raw Typography, uh, Rebel or Rebel, but I forgot the title because they asked me so long ago. So now it's called Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, Typography and Lettering from the Underground Press. You can choose the one you want best. As Robert Hughes described the weekly paste-up night at New York's East Village Other uh, as a data experience, uh, and while none of us who were toiling into the wee hours of the morning at one of America's oldest underground newspapers, founded in 1965, knew what data was, we assumed that for Time Magazine's newly appointed art critic to spend his first nights in America with us, it must be important. Paste Up Night was open to anybody who drifted up to the dingy second floor loft above Bill Graham's Fillmore East, the famous rock palace on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street just next door to Ratner's famous dairy restaurant in a neighborhood that during the uh, teens and 20s was the heart of New York's Yiddish theater. The original office was a storefront on Avenue A across the street from Tompkins Square Park, just a block from Ed Sanders' Peace bookstore where he published his proto-underground Fuck You, a magazine for the arts. And another block from the Psychedelic Atessin, a landmark of East Village where underground papers could be readily found as, whether, as well as other delights. When I was 15 or so years old, the East Village other was where I wanted to be. I wanted to work there, I wanted to make cartoon drawings. There was the rat, other scenes, the free press, the avatar, and others, but Evo was the big time. Evo was the cream of radical comic art, the ground zero of anti-establishment insurrection. I was a wannabe with no sense of design, designers, type, typographers, lettering, or letterers. I didn't know what a mechanical or a VLOX was or how newspapers and magazines were made. But I was inextricably drawn to what was becoming a phenomenon that would transform mass media in the way the digital revolution is done today. Underground papers were the blogs of their day. Unfortunately, the folks at Evo didn't want me. I had much more to learn. And the East Village was the East Coast hippie capital. And I'm in that picture somewhere. If you can find it, you get a prize. By the way, the underground press was also the alternative press. And before continuing, I must make an important disclaimer. Although the papers I'm speaking about attacked convention and indeed were targets of police and legal investigations, no one was risking their physical lives like the underground creators of World War II. Real undergrounds were literally published in secrecy, hidden underground in basements from the authorities, susceptible at any time to murderous reprisals. These are French and Czech anti-Nazi undergrounds. Some were set in type and mimeographed. Others were made from typewriter with text and headlines that were hand drawn. American undergrounds paid homage to the real thing, but they weren't the real thing. Which is not to diminish the 60s undergrounds. These were also continuously surveilled by the police and FBI and deemed contraband by the US Army. And yet there was little sense of danger. Even when I was arrested twice, I was still convinced that this is America, after all, and it can't happen here. I still believe that, ha, ha, ha. A year after my Evo rejection, I joined the ranks of New York's undergrounds. 
I was still in high school, accepted into NYU as an English major. But working on underground papers captured my interest and passion. So I never went to class. Instead, I learned how to make layouts. This is my start. I wanted to be a cartoonist and a writer. Lettering came with the territory. I wasn't very good at it. My talents never improved, but I persisted. What did I love? The naughtiness, the rebellion, the in-your-face arrogance, the paper, the ink, the printing. I do not have to be professionally trained to be professional. Just working on an underground paper was like learning a new language. And this language some of my friends called graphic design. Although I used a lot of different lettering methods, including dry transfer Letraset, I was introduced to this wonderful Rube Goldberg machine called the phototypositor. For those unfamiliar with it, I'm so sorry, you could set photo headlines inside this machine on strips of photosensitive paper that would develop before your very eyes. I could smash, overlap, indeed do almost anything with the letters. I also used the Variotyper to set headlines. This deserves a drink. <laughs> this was a more cumbersome machine to operate. The results were not as good. Letters came on plastic disks, and nuanced letter spacing was almost impossible to achieve. Also, the selection of face faces were more like feces. They were extremely limited. Then there was this little beauty. You saw a piece of it in the IBM presentation. It was one component of a larger magnetic tape typesetting system, the MTST. To rent the entire gizmo was actually pretty expensive, but this piece of it could be rented cheaply, and actually you didn't have to pay for it because you could ignore the bills. How it worked? You'd type line by line on the left side of the page, which would give you a numerical measurement that was dialed into the machine on the right side. You'd retype the same line on the right side of the page according to that measure, and it automatically justified columns. It was a big pain in the ass. That's why text was usually unjustified in underground papers. The type was produced on these golf balls, which became standard on many IBM business machines and allowed a certain versatile selection of styles. But break one, and you'll have one less style to use. They were expensive. Now, a bit of a disclaimer. Got that? I was 17 when I started working for the New York Free Press. I knew nothing about typography and layout. When I got the job, I was called a mechanical artist, and that was a mystery too, but I muddled along. I was, however, quite cute. I wanted to be a cartoonist illustrator, but sometimes we're just not born with the talent to fulfill our desires. Even with my limitations, I was promoted to be the so-called art director of the Freep. The display type I used here was IBM body text, blown up about 250% and pasted on a layout board. I never heard the words spacing or kerning. At a certain point, someone introduced me to a type specimen book from which it was possible to spec or specify any style I wanted. It would be photo set and returned on galleys for paste up. What a revelation. Paste up was done either with glue, two coats, or wax. Most of the free press photos of this kind came from the performance artist Yayoi Kusama, who is now the polka dot queen and one of the most famous Rest, uh, artists in the world. Then she was just a lunatic. In addition to all our other political, social, and cultural content, sex played a big role in underground papers. That was the taboo of taboos, and Dan will echo this after my talk. You'd have to say that the free press was more a picture than gr typographically driven publication. If someone else were art director, it might have been different. This cover was a feature exposing plain clothes or red squad cops who attended and agitated at all the anti-war rallies we went to. This ad was a milestone for me. No, it's not great, but I had a concept, make it like a newspaper. And I used News Gothic Bold, a face I set on Typositor. 
The political underground press evolved into the sex press, and the motto for Screw was the first and best in the field it created. I guess had I gone to art school, I would have known how to do knockouts and surprints and crop photographs so they didn't look like junk, but I didn't, so it all looks like junk. In 1968, just shy of my 18th birthday, the freep folded and I became publisher and art director of the New York Review of Sex, later called the New York Review of Sex and Politics, and finally called the New York Review of Sex and Politics and Aerospace. I was designing more seriously, you might say, but I had this idea that good typography was always flush with something. So when designing this masthead, I included the black bars to fill up the empty space. Actually, I could do anything I wanted because my two older partners did not care about design, so I was free to wreak havoc. As it turned out, the paper failed after 20 issues. But for those issues, I began to learn about type and its voices and its personalities. Since I was getting serious about type, I looked at models. Monocle magazine, designed by Phil Gipps, blew me away. It included artists like Milton, Seymour Quast, Robert Grossman, who just passed away, R.O. Blackman, Ed Sorrell. It was not sloppy or slapdash, but it had character and looked old and new at the same time. I wanted to do that. For 25 cents a piece, I bought dozens of the 1962 magazine that I found on used bookstore tables at local East Village bookstores. I'd cut them up to use the type, ornaments, dingbats, and whatever else I could salvage for my own layouts. These, those old wood and metal faces, although I didn't know what they were at the time, came in handy for vintage-looking headline treatments. I also learned about the wonders of the dollar-a-word, free-delivery typographic houses around New York. They were as prodigious as Starbucks. I could order them at all point sizes, and voila, professional-looking design not unlike desktop publishing. Another huge evolutionary revelation was the Morgan press types. These were the wellspring of Monocle's typefaces. Douglas Morgan was an inveterate typeface collector, had an infinite variety of antique novelty and display faces, and like Dan Solo, another bottomless resource for vintage faces, Morgan Press supplied type to dozens of undergrounds, if only because his catalogs were easily copied and cut up. It was my privilege decades later to write Morgan's obituary for the Times, where I basically apologized for stealing all his type. Another influence for many undergrounds would, was Harvey Kurtzman's Mad Comics, mostly for the irreverent and paredic comics, but... Pregnant pause. The circus-like bifurcated slab serif mad logo in its post-comics code iteration as a magazine was my type design inspiration. I've always loved that type. You can see a little of the influence with the headline here, Our Man in the Big Apple. I mentioned earlier I was arrested twice and went to trial on charges of criminal pandering. One reason, ironically, was this especially clean issue, which literally had no sexual content in it whatsoever. After putting us out of business, the charges were dropped. I used a lot of pseudonyms on the masthead, which bollocksed up the subpoena system. I was called before a grand jury investigating a play called Che, but they didn't know I was Michelle Lee. It's a long story, so ask me later. Let's get back to type which took a psychedelic turn in the mid-1960s. Victor Moscoso, whose work is shown here and who this year has gotten the AIGA Medal for Lifetime Achievement, was the master of the typeface. He combined Victorian and Italianate slab serifs with Art Nouveau and Jugendstil to make typographic patterns. By adding vibrating colors, he made his concoction readable yet illegible and helped invent the psychedelic style. Much of the inspiration for this lettering came from here. Sacred Spring was the journal of the Vienna Secession. Here, lettering was integrated into an 
into and express the aesthetic of anti-academic art at the turn of the century. The letters were as organic as the decorations. Some were readable, a few were not, but once the visual code was deciphered, it was easy for the initiated to figure it out. The curvilinear Art Nouveau aesthetic became the official letter style of the underground movement. The 19th century integration of type and image was incorporated into the style, and split fountain vibrating colors exuded the aura of sex, drugs, and rock culture. This is the San Francisco Oracle, the underground paper that led the psychedelic charge, as is this. The DIY methods of setting type were time intensive, requiring a lot of hand cutting and pasting, but effects like contoured body type were emblematic of the age. The split fountain was an essential effect, mixing two colors to get a rainbow effect as the ink rolled through the rollers on a press was a common way to make more of limited resources. Overprinting and surprinting were conventional techniques. Some results were pretty chaotic, some were right on. The page on the left was by Rick Griffin, one of the lettering geniuses of the psychedelic poster group. Sadly, he passed away in a car accident. And here's Griffith in all his spiritual Art Nouveau psychedelic glory. Still makes me want to trip. He also designed the first logo type for Rolling Stone. And he incorporated his lettering with ancient mystic iconography for ads like this one for the Grateful Dead. Masthead or logo lettering changed often, and the quality was dependent on the talents of the artists. This is the great speckled bird. Open City from LA was an extra large broadsheet, and the logo was actually smartly done. The Chicago Seed owed much to Jugendstil influences, as you can see by all of those curvilinear ferns and tendrils. And even in the logo here, although it seemed to have used Helvetica. Psychedelics became such a recognizable code for youth culture that Photo Lettering Inc. could not resist putting out its own catalog designed by Ed Benguet. But I'll tell you a story. It's just between us. On two occasions, I requested photo lettering to set the mastheads for Screw and the New York Review of Sex. And they refused, citing moral objections. Thanks to Letraset, however, it was very easy to find novelty faces, and they too filled many underground papers. Remember I said that Robert Hughes had said something about data. Well, it wasn't until I saw this George Gross poster a few years later with the varying type style and sizes and the stock il cut illustrations that I understood what he meant regarding the underground press layouts. We were avant-garde and we didn't know it. In retrospect, it's easy to pick out precedents. Can you guess what year this was done? Please don't look at the date. Wyndham Lewis's The Enemy, published in 1927, almost 100 years ago? No, 91 years, thanks. My math skills are as bad as my type skills. Uh, looks like it could have been done in the 60s or even today. Here are a few more of well over 600 undergrounds that are listed in the books I showed you at the beginning. Each has its own character, but all fit the same mold. Newsprint, one, two, or three color printing, DIY hand lettering, and poorly set type. Here are some more. The East Village Other, getting back to them, experimented with various approaches. This was by a master named Fred McGubgub, who with Pablo Ferro were the pioneers of on-screen motion design. This was meant to be animated and loses its kinetic power as a static image, but it's nonetheless fascinating as, he sp as a split fountain going from hard to see yellow to red. And I watched him make this, taking him over 12 hours to draw the whole thing, while on one side was a big bag of Coke, and on the other side was a couple of bottles of Coke. <laughs> this is Kim Deitch. 
And this is Vaughn Bodie, a great cartoonist who actually knew how to use the variotype faces pretty well. Can you guess who designed this masthead? His initials are MG. He's sitting here. I later screwed it up by adding the balloon shading. And I'm really sorry, Milton. I designed the ACE logo after I learned how to use a compass and ruling pen. The artwork is by Skeeter Davis, a pseudonym for Art Spiegelman. We all had pseudonyms in those days. Having access to a typositor and IBM typesetter allowed me to open a studio on the side. On off hours from screw, I'd do freelance. So this is a strange combo of Andy Warhol's interview, which I designed using Broadway and Bussarama typefaces, which I heartily recommend to all of you, <laughs> and Slim News, which was set in Stymie. I must say Slim News looks pretty good even today. You don't have to say so, though. <laughs> I mentioned that Mad Magazine Comics was a great inspiration. Simpleton was illustrated by Sherry Flanagan. Yarrow Stalks, which some argue was the first of the comics-based underground, was by R. Crum, who also drew the masthead like a comic splash panel. The East Village Other pu published the Gothic Blimp works, also with Crum. And they also published Trash Man by Spain Rodriguez, whose character was a lefty, druggy superhero firing something that resembles one of today's lethal assault weapons. Uh, but remember, this was the 60s. Air Pirates Funnies was illustrated by Bobby London, who would often adopt and adapt comic styles from the 20s and 30s comic pages, hence the splash panel nameplate. And Yellow Dog was another compilation of comics that prefigures underground comic books and decades later, graphic novels. To end with, I want to pay my homage to Herb Lubalin in this, his 100th anniversary year. He smashed, overlapped, made expressionistic, created pictorial typography, which was a primary inspiration for me later on. And you could do this on the phototypositor or the Stat King that was also a terrific tool. I just swoon even today over what he was able to do with letters, how they fit together as words that supplemented and complemented the other content. This, I'm afraid, is as close as I could come to Herb. I designed the masthead and tried within my limited skills to approximate his typographic expression. It was fun, but a, a good thing, I can assure you, that I left typography to Louise Feely, Paula Scher, and Gail Anderson, or I'd be out of work today. These were the un-undergrounds. They were professional new left magazines that followed less anarchic, but no less inspiring typographic roads. This was designed by the late Dougald Sturmer, whose layout for the Sunday Ramparts was actually usurped by Rolling Stone. And this was edited by Richard Goldstein, the first ro real rock critic, serious rock critic in the US who did the first uh, review of uh, Sgt. Pepper. And it was his counterculture mainstream paperback. And we end with what happened in 1969 when Hearst Publishing took the anarchy of the underground and slapped it on a glossy magazine for the youth culture market, thus co-opting everything that the underground had done. So in the end, I must say that all things must pass. Thank you very much. <laughs>